Hello and welcome to Stand in the Gap. I'm Sam Rohr, and I'm going to be joined again today by Isaac Crockett. Uh, and today again, and for probably several more weeks, we're going to be recording this program from our individual locations uh, via the technology of Zoom, while we remain unable to physically gather due to the, co the constraints of this uh, coronavirus plague. I trust that you and your family are doing well. And in these days of uncertainty and um, increasing challenge to our constitutional freedoms, that you are first and foremost seeking God's wisdom and the biblical principles that undergird how we should think and act in these troublesome times. This will not be the only time we will see things like this. We need to be very careful how we approach them. Uh, pursuing knowledge and, and, uh, and truth is critical. And we talk about that a lot on this program. Um, it's important also to look back at history and the foundational principles which uh, undergird our Constitution and as recognized uh, uh, by our founders, our God-given uh, basic rights and freedoms. Now, in next week's program, Isaac and I are going to present some basic principles, which I believe will be very, very helpful to every Christian and every God-fearing and patriotic Christian in America regarding how we should approach times like this. And uh, we believe that the Bible does speak to every issue in life. We talk about that a lot, right? Well, do we believe it? Well, we need to, because the Word of God does give us that help. At the same time, it is also very critical that we look back and revisit history, even in our own nation, uh, in regard to uh, earlier pandemics or epidemics, perhaps as they were, and similar events, and how they affected our citizens, how our government leaders responded to them, and how we take and balance the truths of biblical truth with our constitutional realities, and both of them are linked, and look at how others dealt with similar things in the past. And today we're really pleased, uh, there's nobody better uh, to talk with us about our history and what has happened than our good friend David Barton. He's the founder of Wall Builders. Many of you watching this program uh, know David and, uh, and their great ministry. He's been on this program before, but we're going to talk with him relative to going back in our history, looking at things and times uh, similar to what we have now, how our leaders responded then, and how the people of our nation responded then. And with that, I want to welcome to the program right now, uh, David. Uh, Barden. David, thank you for being with us. Hey, Sam. Good to be with you, Isaac. Great to be with you, too. Uh, David, uh, you again. People know you. You are an historian. You also are a, a biblical guy. You talk a lot about biblical worldview. You know the Lord as your personal Savior, so you have access to truth like we do, but you've done a special work in this area. Before we begin and kind of call out uh, and look at a couple of uh, most notable past events, why don't you give us uh, right now, if you if you could, um, a a listing perhaps of uh, epidemics or pandemics or similar events that have occurred in our nation's history um, that uh, that would be instructional for us today. Yeah, if you go back to the Bible reality of Ecclesiastes one nine, there is nothing new under the sun. Uh, times change, technology changes, issues don't. So if we were in 1633, we would be in the middle of a smallpox pandemic. If we rolled a forward to 1793, we would find ourselves in the middle of the yellow fever epidemic. If we went into the 1830s to the 1860s, we would find ourselves in three different cholera epidemics. Uh, if we went from the 1840s to the 1870s, we have another three different uh, yellow fever epidemics. Uh, if we get into 1858, we've got a scarlet fever epidemic. If we get into 1906, we have a typhoid epidemic. Uh, if we get into 1918, the Spanish flu is, is a huge issue. Uh, you get into 1921 for four years, 1921 through 1925. Diphtheria is the epidemic we're dealing with. Then we have 40 years of a polio pandemic. Uh, thousands a year die as a result of that over 40 years from about 1916 through about 1955. Uh, if you go to 1957, we had the Asian flu, which was a really big deal. Um, if you get into 1968, it's the Hong Kong flu. Uh, between 1981 and 1991, for 10 years, we lost nearly 10,000 people a year to measles. So we had a measles epidemic for a full decade. Uh, if you want to go to, to 2009, the swine flu, or here we are this year, 2020, with, with corona. 
So we've had a lot of medical epidemics across our, our history. And by the way, this is nothing new biblically. Uh, we know that the Bible imposes quarantines and isolation for medical reasons for several different, different causes, whether you're in Numbers or Second Kings or whether you're in Leviticus. Uh, this is also biblically dealt with as well. Well, David, basically what you're saying is that all of our viewers, as we're listening here today, should, should understand that what we are seeing today is not, it's novel from that perspective, as you would say, it's, it's new, this strain of virus. But the impact of physical problems causing deaths and fatalities is not new. And so, ladies and gentlemen, when we come back, we're going to talk with Dave a little bit further and have him pick out, we're going to look at maybe the top one, two, or three of these uh, previous epidemics, uh, the ones that would be most similar, perhaps, to what we have now. And we'll talk about what we can learn from them. We'll be back in just a moment. Truth, flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history or powerfully relevant? Culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs? The pastor, commentator or frontline combatant? Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter. With hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide, a website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution. Educating, informing, equipping. This is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Welcome back to the program. I'm Isaac Crockett, uh, joined with Sam Rohr and our special guest today, David Barton. And as we come back uh, to this subject of, uh, of looking at uh, the, the context of where pandemics, epidemics, of how they've affected our nation in the past, uh, we wanna look at uh, the response in the past so that it can guide our response today. That's the point of studying history is to learn what we can do today. And so, um, David, thank you again so much for being on this program, for, for joining us uh, via Zoom. And I'm just wondering if you could maybe talk to us about some of these other epidemics or even worldwide pandemics that have hit our, our country in the past. And you just cited a whole bunch of them going all the way back uh, to the 1600s. And so if, if you were to look at those, some of those ones you just quoted to us, would there be one in particular that impacted Americans, um, maybe that there, uh, there was a government involvement back then that we could kind of look to that similar to what's going on today and find out maybe some sort of uh, reasoning or some sort of step forward based off of what we've done in the past? Yeah, actually, uh, I would probably point to three total. There's one that deals with the people's response. There's one that deals with the church's response. And there's one that deals with the government's response. And so the first one I would choose would probably be the smallpox epidemic of 1633. I choose that because uh, of what we're facing today with the fear factor. Uh, there is a lot of fear across the nation. Uh, we know what's happening now as the number of deaths have gone up with COVID, the number of suicides have gone up. The people feeling isolated, feeling depressed, feeling alone, uh, it, that's a, a big deal. I was talking to a state rep here recently who just did a, a, a big analysis on what they call the psychologically fragile, those that are really suffering now because of the isolation and, and the fear. Well, if I were back in, and by the way, the, the death rate right now in 39 of the 50 states, the, the mortality rate is 11 uh, persons per million, or about one out of a thousand are, are dying in America. So we have a, a fairly small percentage that are dying, although we, we're now up around over 30,000 deaths. Percentage-wise, it is small. We have 330 million in America. In 1633, the mortality rate was over 70% for the smallpox epidemic. So seven out of 10, not one out of a thousand, or excuse me, not one out of a hundred thousand, uh, which is 11 parts per million. We're talking 70 out of a hundred or seven out of 10. So the fear factor was much, much, much greater back then. Um, but the difference was they were much more grounded. 
with God. As you look across Massachusetts, as you look across uh, the New England areas, so many of those guys had come here on the Bible, on religious liberty. And for them, death was, that was a step into eternal life. Today, this is the most secular America has ever been. And so we're watching governors and, and mayors respond out of fear and panic and, and shutting down stuff that's never been shut down before because they're just scared to death somebody's going to die. And so the confidence of, of courage is, is really what we don't see right now nationally. We do see community, community, and certainly courageous people, um, but it's very different from what it was, say, for, for the smallpox epidemic of 1633, 1634. And David, that's interesting, and I and uh, we'll go this direction. I want to ask you about the government, the the one that had the biggest government involvement next. But uh, a point you made there, I think, is worth touching on, and that is the worldview of people at that time um, caused them not to panic or to fear because of the fear of death, because they knew, as we don't, as believers, that if we are to pass away. We're only going to step from here into eternity with the Lord. And that's what we want to do. But for those who do not know the Lord, who have rejected uh, a biblical worldview understanding of God in redemption, they frankly have a reason to fear at these days. So that's interesting. Uh, any, any other comment on that you'd want to make before I go on to your example of a church of, of government involvement? Yeah, I would say that, that what we're dealing with right now is, is really Hebrews 2.15. And, and let me put it in historical context. Historically, as you look back in previous generations, and we're surrounded here um, with so much historical stuff, uh, we have uh, in, in this area right here, we have more than 100,000 items from before 1812. So the thousands of hand, I'm sitting right here by George Washington's drum from the American Revolution, but whether it's Adams or Jefferson or Washington, whether it's medical stuff that was used back in the yellow fever epidemic of 1793 when the church really stepped up, whatever it is, we're surrounded by, by lots of history. Having said that, as we go through all the biographies that were written in previous generations, it's interesting that the final chapter in virtually every biography looked at how someone died. Uh, so if you were George Whitfield, your final chapter is how did you die? If you're Thomas Paine, the final chapter is how did you die? If you're George Washington, final chapter, how do you die? And the reason they did that, Hebrews 2.15 says that if you have a relationship with Christ, you have no fear of death. And so if you were George Whitfield and you came right to the verge of death and, and death back then didn't have all the medical stuff that we have now to kind of soften what, what happened. Uh, as you look into eternity, if you showed fear and panic looking into eternity, they said, you know, George Whitfield really wasn't a Christian because if he had been a Christian, he wouldn't have had a fear of death. And so that's why every final chapter looked at how you dealt with, with passing out of this life into the next. So what we see right now is a fear of death. Uh, and we're seeing people go to excessive extremes because they are scared to death of dying because this is all they know is what's here. They, they don't know of an afterlife. They don't even understand that there will be an afterlife, whether it's heaven, hell, or whatever they choose. It's, it's their choice through Christ. So that's one thing that stands out to me is, is the whole culture was built around understanding that you are going to go into eternity. Are you ready to go into eternity? And so the response is quite different public policy-wise. Uh, if you're surrounded with leaders who understand a biblical worldview, what you do is call for days of prayer and fasting. If we can get a hold of God on this and get God to intervene, then we can see an end to this. And so while we did everything we could medically, Dr. Benjamin Rush is a great example of an early doctor who did so much with the yellow fever epidemic. We did everything we could medically, but we also relied on God, unlike uh, Governor Cuomo today who said, death rate's going down. We did this. God did not do it. God had no part oh my gosh, we would never have thought of saying that in a previous generation. And, and Dave, uh, boy, David, difference. you're right on the spot right there. And we've talked about that governor's comment as well. And I just shook when yeah. I heard him make that comment. Cause I say, it's like the, it's like the Kings of Psalm two, lifting their fists to the God of heaven and saying, who are you? We can do what we want. Scary. That's right. Let's That's go to right. the next one. Now you're talking about that was the, that was the smallpox plague, 1633 death rate, seven out of 10. We're talking now one out of a thousand. Wow, they had reason to fear back there, but they did not because of their belief in God. What's the example that you can think of, David, that uh, would be uh, where government perhaps in past times had a very significant or most significant involvement? And Sam, let me say, check what I said. I said one out of a thousand. It was one out of a hundred thousand. So right now we're one out of a hundred thousand. 
um, as opposed to seven out of 10. Uh, the one that had the biggest government response would be the Spanish flu of, of 1918. Uh, in 1918, 675,000 Americans died. Uh, somewhere between 20 and 50 million worldwide uh, died as a result of, of that flu. This was going on in World War I. Uh, President Woodrow Wilson never even mentioned it. He did not talk about it. We would call it, a, it, it is a global pandemic. It is certainly a national epidemic with 675,000 deaths. And there was absolutely no response from President Woodrow Wilson because we understood federalism. And federalism is the government, the federal government's not in charge of health care. That's a state and that's a, a local issue. And so this was dealt with state by state and city by city. Uh, the states did not do all that much, but the cities did. You have, for example, St. Louis, who really kind of shut stuff down. They, they, they put uh, limited hours on businesses. Uh, they did the, the social distancing and stay at home kind of stuff. And you had Philadelphia, who did virtually nothing. Uh, so it was, and Philadelphia had probably the highest mortality rate of any city. So at that point, that's why they look today back to things like the Spanish flu, city by city, they handled it. It was, it was the concept of federalism. And so as you looked at it then, um, churches were involved, but they understood the government can't tell the church what to do. So they asked the churches to cooperate. The churches were very good citizens, said, yes, we will cooperate. But then as the numbers started flattening out toward the end, the churches said, look, the numbers are flattening we're going to go back to, to worship. We're going to go back to service. We're going to get, we're going to get back to God and, and doing what, and, and I think that's kind of where we are now. We're seeing that across the, the country uh, with not only we've seen protests of people wanting to go back to work, and there was never really a government full shutdown of work at any point in time. They curtailed the hours, they limited it, but they did not destroy the economy. And so this is, this is a new one with this, the, the fear and panic, the government intervention has jumped in. Uh, we will see when this is all over. As we look at places like Sweden that has done virtually no shutdown and their infection rates about the same, or you look at South Dakota, which has done no shutdown at all, and they're doing extremely well. So there will be post analysis of this to see, uh, for example, our, our Dallas County Sheriff here in Texas, our Dallas County judge here in Texas, just panicked. He, he predicts that 495,000 Texans, not Americans, Half a million Texans are going to die in this thing, and he has shut everything down. And so, you know, it's, this is unlike the Spanish flu of 1918, but that's where we saw the government really observe federalism. They got involved. They used cooperative partnerships. They did, they did somewhat hurt the economy. Um, they did social distancing, but not like we're seeing today. David, you, you've answered some of the questions I was going to ask you, but could you maybe expound upon that just a little bit as far as contrasting? Can we look back on any time in, in our history of these epidemics or, or pandemics and find something similar uh, to the, the reaction of the government and similar to what, you know, the impact on the economy as, as what we're seeing right now? Now, there's been no reaction. But this is the most government we've ever seen uh, in, in any pandemic in, in, in this sense. So this is the most government intervention. There was a lot in, in 2009 with the swine flu, but again, America is becoming more secular at that point in time. We also understood less about the constitution then, our constitutional knowledge today and our biblical knowledge, both are the lowest that they have been in recorded history. So with a low constitutional knowledge and a low biblical knowledge, the fear factor is high, the panic factor is high, and the constitutional factor is low. You throw those two things together, this is the greatest government intervention we have seen historically. Um, and again, the question is, will it make a difference? Probably not. We're not out of this yet, but as we watch other nations and as we watch uh, other states doing something very different, their numbers are almost the same as what we're seeing. So the question now, and if I can go to the declaration for just a moment, when the founding fathers wrote that document, they put forth six principles of government. Everything in the Constitution goes to one of those six principles. Three of the principles were very simple. There is a creator God. The creator God has given us inalienable rights, and it is the purpose of government to protect our inalienable rights. Well, the same founding fathers who told us that we had a right to assemble, a right to worship, a right to petition, uh, all the things that we're be seeing attacked right now, also said that we had an inalienable right to provide for our family, to provide an income. And therefore, government did not interfere with jobs, did not interfere with personal incomes, 
because that's a God-given responsibility and a God-given right. And so whether it was Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin, George Washington, they all talked about the government is not to interfere with business. And, and so that's something really that we're seeing different now. We no longer see the right to make a living as an inalienable right. That's a government granted um, a privilege. And, and so that's being regulated as if the government granted that privilege. So uh, as we have seen across the past week and a half, actually 10, 10 to 14 days, we're now seeing a, a lot of attack on First Amendment rights. Uh, we've been very active in court. We have not lost a single case in court over the last two weeks on mayors and states and others trying to shut down churches and religious activities and how they meet or telling them how they're going to meet. We're winning every single case. Uh, we now have a number coming into court as well <clears throat> with that, that deal with petition as we're seeing protests shut down and assemblies shut down, even social distancing protests and assemblies where people are maintaining social distancing. They're saying, no, protesting is not an essential right or not an essential, um, it's not an essential need. Yeah, it is, it's a First Amendment guarantee. That is absolutely. an essential need. Absolutely, David, absolutely it is. And I want you to come back, we're just about the end here. I want you to come back and I want to give you, Isaac's gonna get into it a little bit, give you some summary thoughts now based on these things, what people should do. We'll be back in just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of WBPH Philadelphia. Positively different television. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap. I'm Isaac Crockett and my co-host is Sam Rohr. We're talking with uh, our friend and historian, uh, David Barton. And David, you've been giving us a lot of historical facts. Uh, could you maybe now kind of take what you've been giving us, give us a summary, kind of uh, even kind of switch gears from historian hat into preacher, you know, putting your preacher hat on, so to speak, and kind of maybe applying uh, what this means for us, looking back at history, looking at the worldview and the different things that you've talked about and the different epidemics that have hit us, um, and now apply that to what we're going through and what we ought to do as Christians today. Yeah, I would say I will go to a statement from John Jay, uh, founding father, original justice Supreme Court, who said every citizen ought diligently to read and study the Constitution of his country. By knowing their rights, they'll sooner perceive when they're being violated and be the better prepared to defend and assert them. Mm -hmm. So if we know the document, we can stand up for rights. But I would also say that about the Bible. We ought to diligently read and study the Bible. And so we are not only Christians, we are Christian citizens. We need to stand up for our constitutional rights. We do not need to lose any of our rights as a result of this government growth and intervention. But as a biblical Christian, we need to know what the Bible says and be better prepared to serve those around us. Uh, the, the one epidemic of 1793 yellow fever, the church stood, and I mean, it was, it was the difference in that epidemic. And we have an opportunity now for Christians and the church to stand and lead, and they really need to do that. And uh, David, thank you for that summary. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, I hope that this a little bit of analysis today has been helpful to you. Um, we perhaps, those of you who are watching this, may not recall any of the examples that have been given. Got to go back in history to, uh, to see them, but they have happened. Uh, the same God that took uh, our nation citizens and Christians through those difficult circumstances before is the same one today. The question is, are we the same? And I think as David is sharing, we're not. Uh, we have a lot of people who do not have a fear of God. We've rejected God as a nation. We've done things to actually upend God's moral law. And as a result of it, we have a lot more people fearing that which is natural. It's unappointed, it's un it's appointed unto man once to die and after this, the judgment. If we understand that, we don't fear death, but we prepare for it because it's the one thing that is absolutely certain. But it's not certain whether or not you will spend time in heaven with the Lord forever or in hell with the devil. That's the two, those are the two choices under a biblical worldview. We hope 
said in these times that if you know the Lord as your Savior, be confident in that and live accordingly and share it with your neighbors. And if they don't, bring them to Jesus Christ. That's the solution. He is the solution. Well, we thank you for watching us today uh, here on this program, and uh, we pray that you will be encouraged in the Lord. Knowledge of the truth of God's Word is what is stabilizing and what we need. Let us know that you're watching the program, that you are praying for us. Go to our website, standinthegapmedia.org. Let us know that you are there. We thank you for being with us. Stand in the gap for truth until we meet again next time.